concerned piece, you can still be concerned, and you are wiser, and you do have wisdom to share, but remembering um, not to lead first with the concern, because sometimes in leading first with the concern, that's like the mother who said, what, when she said she was going to switch majors, right? She was concerned, and she shared her concern, but that can often come across as invalidation or judgment. So being calm, curious, compassionate, and then, and then concerned. I know there's a question there, but just I want to quickly add, uh, the reason that it's hard to talk about emotions is because they're hard to talk about, right? We, we avoid them. And so part of what you can do by listening is to show that it's not scary. And often um, what I've found that some Asian American clients find is that they didn't get a lot of what's called mirroring from parents growing up. This idea that they might say something about their experience and the parent will reflect back what that is. The child might not even know, oh, you're sad because this happened. So you're helping them to understand these complex emotions and experiences that they may not have enough experience to do so. You know, before jumping in with your advice or um, some sort of uh, uh, judgment of what they've brought to you, maybe just listening and trying to help process and reflect. And then I see Lily has a question over there. Uh, uh, I'm just going to uh, make a comment um, from my social science background uh, about uh, challenges uh, the college student face uh, in that stage of life. Because as parents, uh, we really think that you know we have invested so much emotionally, financially, and in or other ways, um, just waiting for that big moment when our child get the admission letter from college, and then our job is done. But it's not. Um, I think in the story of Luke, he was very vulnerable as an Asian uh, American. But in general, I want to say um, college students are a high-risk population of suicide uh, in general and even in China. Uh, I think there are several uh, factors uh, to explain that. First is just the, all the challenges uh, a person faces when entering a new environment. Uh, they are away from parents, from uh, family and friends, and all of a sudden they need to handle everything by themselves. Uh, the other factor is um, the, uh, the change of expectations, because um, especially for children who entered um, high, uh, very prestigious universities, they were the stars in your high school, but all of a sudden when they started a new semester, they found themselves just a you know, so-so student, and they were so stressed out. Um, so I think as parents, how to help them to adjust your expectations and uh, think about studying as a lifelong process is very important. But I, um, I also want to emphasize the third factor that is the um, transition to adulthood. Um, it's, it's not just a one-time uh, event, it's a stage of life. Um, I think before that turning point, they tend to consider themselves as children, but all of a sudden, they, they are adults. They are expected to make all kinds of decisions themselves and uh, uh, be told to grow up. I think um, there's a lot of anxieties involving in that um, stage of life. Um, so I would like to offer some um, um, not solution, but probably the ways parents can help uh, with their children. Uh, that is try to extend this one-time event into a, uh, a lens of, uh, it's a period. So before they made the turning point, uh, before they started college, try to give them some opportunity to make their own decision, being independent, uh, to make themselves feel that they are uh, getting ready to be adults. And after they started college, try to give them more support than what we usually um, consider because uh, they really need uh, guidance and uh, need people to, uh, who can listen to them. Thank you. I'll speak for all three of us on the panel, and that was fantastic, and I think we agree wholeheartedly. And there's an empty chair right over here if you'd like to come up and sit and join us, because that was really fantastic. And then another like, little quick thing to add in terms of your advice, which I agree with, um, um, another thing, a really simple thing that parents can do um, is, is when you're asking your child about things, like think, think about what you're asking them. And I would say focus on the child, your child's effort 
more on their effort and less on the outcome. So it's not what grade did you get, you know, but you know, did you try your hardest or what was that like studying for that test? It's not about the grade because then what happens is, and I think Justin talked about this a bit. There's there's overemphasis on getting the A and doing the best and getting the award or getting to Harvard. But then if you don't get that, like when I thought I was going to go to an Ivy League school and I didn't get into any of them, then then what? Then. Burger King, right? I mean, that's where we laugh, but that's where that kind of black and white thinking ends up coming from, is because you, you, you have this complete divide, and it is absolutely a process. I think there was a question up front. Yeah, uh, I was listening to uh, Dr. Lewis' uh, splendid speech, and when he mentioned a term, which is racial identity, uh, well, it really, it, it was catching my soul. Um, well, um, I'm not Asian American, I'm not Chinese American, uh, I'm just a typical international student from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Well, I'm a senior. Um, one of my majors is... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, one of my majors is, is the Asian studies. Well, um, as you know, many Chinese students uh, who are who studying in American college, um, they major in math, uh, technology, uh, business, science, but why do I major in East Asian studies? You know, even my um, friends in China, you know, they just ask me, uh, why do you let American teach you East Asian studies? <laughs> well, I think uh, that's my racial identity. Um, I, I can tell if um, I want to pursue American green card or American citizen status. Um, I think your national status, your national identity is not conflicting with your racial identity. They are not conflicting. Um, but I'm more and more confused yeah, when I'm majoring in Asian studies. Yeah, there are many um, white people, uh, black people, uh, who are very interested in East Asian culture, civilization, but um, they are just minor, yeah, just minor um, Asian American, Chinese American um, who are really, really interested, who indeed care our own, yeah, our own culture and civilization. Um, well, yeah, one of my favorite book, and uh, yeah, Analex Lun Yu. Um, well, I can always find my uh, racial identity in, well, in um, Confucius. And, um, you know, Chinese people know um, there's a term called uh, filiality. Uh, in Chinese, it's xiao dao. I think, um, I'm not sure if Luke has ever realized that um, he should be filial, he should be self to his family. I'm not judging him, I'm not judging him. Um, I can't tell if, well, his choice is right or wrong, but I think if once he realized, yeah, there was a time he realized he should be filial, he is, responsibility to his family, his parents. Um, yeah, he may have other choice. Um, what I'm saying is like, um, well, fidelity, um, yeah, absolutely, is extra pressure, but it could be positive pressure. Um, now, uh, I want to ask, uh, doctors, do you think 
Um, is it necessary to popularize, po I mean, popularize our own traditional culture, like filiality? And in Xiao Dao, um, our own culture, like Ru Jia Xiang Confucius. So I think it's necessary. Is it essential? You know, in the second generation, the third generation of Chinese American among them. Thank you so much for your question. We're three minutes over time, but I just want you guys to know and thank you. Yeah, so Lily, what do you want? We can do like wrap up in a couple minutes. What do you think? And then if folks have It's up to you and then for the audiences too. So. What time does lunch end? Uh, tw uh, yeah. Yeah. 45 minutes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but self-care and eating is very important too. So what we were thinking is, for those who didn't get their questions answered, we are going to be eating, but also welcome people to come ask sort of more private questions. I want to finish this question and then, um, and also it relates, there was someone who asked, did Luke know that he left a lot of pain in the lives of the living? So kind of a question of, what were his responsibilities as a person who committed suicide or completed suicide? So what I want to say is that suicide is actually very complicated. And I've written um, a paper that hopefully will be published soon about conceptions of suicide in East Asia versus Western cultures. And we know that in the West, almost 100% of suicides are thought to be linked to mental illness, like depression or bipolar disorder. But that when they've done those studies in China and India, they actually find much lower rate of mental illness. So I don't know whether that's because of stigma of mental illness and people don't want to like reveal it, or whether suicide has different meaning in Asian or Confucian culture sometimes. And I think that is true because um, in our paper we discuss, um, you know, uh, Mengzi, or I think it was actually Confucius who said, you know, I have to choose between duty and life, and if I have to choose, I choose duty more important than life. So that's sort of the teaching that we that some people grew up with. So in terms of asserting that, I think there could be a role of using culture to say, you know, even though you feel that you have this burden and you must do this, you have other obligations that should keep you here. At the same time, I have to say, you know, we have this misconception that suicide is selfish, and I really don't think that's the case. If you talk to suicidal people, like really try to understand them, they are not, it is not selfish. It's not like, oh, I'd rather do this, I don't care about anyone else. What happens is when people get very depressed, their thinking actually gets very distorted. It gets very narrow. And as I mentioned before, one of the, the hallmark symptoms of depression is feeling like a burden or guilty or worthless. And so you, you take someone who feels like, all I do is take up space, I don't, you know, there may be no reason to live, but also I feel like I'm a burden on other people. So when they self-sacrifice, sometimes it's actually uh, selfless. They think that they're helping the other people by getting rid of themselves because they're so negative and they're so depressed. So I just want to clarify that because that's something my mom always says too, oh, self, a suicide is selfish. And I really think if you talk to people who are suicidal, um, they are very self-focused, but it's not because that's who they are, that's what the disease does. So Lily, is it better for us to then, because we want everyone to eat. To you, it's up to you, because you, you are the speaker. Well, I, th yeah. I think people should eat, but we okay. will stay. All right. So, but we'll con we can continue to answer, because I know there were questions absolutely. here. Absolutely, so um, like I said, the lunch is about an hour and 15 minutes, and um, we, can, we can have an informal networking, and um, thank you so much for your attention. And Lily, may I say, if people want to, if yes. they want to, because they're yes. going to grab their food and some of them can just sit back here. Okay, sure. If you sure. want to, and yeah. then we can continue and you can eat while we Absolutely. Talk. You don't have to. you. Thank you. Yeah. And then I, I do want to make a brief announcement. Just, we have an evaluation forms. Just pass out. Uh, I know that some of you might need to leave in the afternoon, so we really appreciate if you can uh, fill out the forms. And please go eat. Thank you so much.